Oh, sure. I did that another time. You weren't here. We couldn't fix it. All right, everyone. We'll go ahead and get things started today. Thank you all for coming out. Again, this is a wonderful crowd for today. And we're fortunate to have Dr. Tidley hosting this week's Henry's Memorial Weather Briefing. So take it away. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, you know, when you sign up for these things six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, it's like, well, it's the middle of September and it could be like nothing. You know, and it's like, what kind of weather trivia are we going to talk about? But it turns out that's probably not the case. Uh, but I do want to go through just for a couple minutes uh, something that did happen 17 years ago today. So who's an undergraduate? Okay, you guys probably don't remember this firsthand, although you've heard about it your entire lives. Uh, I was in the Pentagon on 9-11, uh, right about now. And uh, one of the things, I'm just going to talk about the weather because that's what we're here to talk about. But this was the surface map, back when we did daily surface maps, uh, of what it looked like. And it was a beautiful fall day. Big, strong, high pressure system, very low dew points, dew points in the 40s and 50s, great visibility. So if you've never flown a plane before, these are about ideal conditions. Because it turns out, if you're flying an aircraft, it's hard to find stuff on the ground that you actually want to find. So I don't think, and I never saw in the 9-11 Commission report any uh, interrogations as to did, they, did the uh, bad guys consider weather. Uh, I think they did consider passenger loading. After Labor Day, the passenger loading comes way down. Back then, there were actually empty seats on aircraft. We don't remember that now. But uh, so there were very few people on these aircraft, but it was also about as good a weather as you could find if you were trying to do the things the terrorists were trying to do. So that happened 17 years ago today, and that was the synoptic situation. Basically, big high, not atypical for September, uh, but had we had weather like we've had this 9, 10, 11 September, my guess is we would have had a very different outcome. Okay, I'll talk about that. Uh, I can't resist just one thing about our local weather before we sort of go global here. This is from my weather station just up at College Heights, a couple kilometers away from, uh, from where we are right now. Uh, what this shows is average temperature, the dark blue line, average dew point about every five minutes for 24 hours. And I've just highlighted the yellow, orange, and red lines. Those are for looking for the dew points. So 60 is sort of the borderline of uncomfortable. 65 is like humid. These are Fahrenheit, of course. And 70 is like it really sucks. And I think I'm back in Mississippi, or at least Virginia. Uh, and you can kind of look starting in late April and certainly in May. We've had a lot of days this year. I would argue probably. I haven't been able to go through the, the records, but my guess is this has been as humid a summer as State College uh, has seen. It hasn't been, the max temperatures haven't been overly warm, but the mins have been very high and the dew points have been very high. Those green bars are uh, rainfall. Uh, the scale of that is on the right. Uh, we just had two consecutive days greater than two inches. Uh, I have not been able to go back through the record. Only one other time. One other time. Okay, I knew somebody would know. It's either Bill or Steve. Somebody would know that. So only one other time have we had that kind of rainfall. And uh, if, with some luck, we may not repeat this in a few days. But if we're unlucky, we'll, we'll get to repeat this. Okay, let's, uh, let's step back just a little bit. This is kind of, this is a water vapor, and it's a stitched together global image from the geostationary satellites. Uh, this is from the Navy Research Lab. This is all a public site. Anybody, everybody here can uh, can take a look at it. And as you can probably see, this is a not unprecedented but somewhat unusual day in which globally in the northern hemisphere we have seven named tropical systems right now. Uh, so we have, I'm not sure if I can remember them all, but we have uh, Aline, Isaac, yeah, Elaine, Isaac, of course, Florence, uh, got an invest area not named yet, just uh, south of Cuba. And if I was in Houston, I'd really be watching that, not so much for winds, but for uh, rain in about three days when everybody focuses on Florence. Uh, Paul is dying. Sorry, Paul. Uh, <laughs> Oliva is uh, about to go through the Hawaiian Islands. That doesn't happen very often. And then if you look out all the way on the right, the real big storm, in the northern hemisphere right now is uh, 
I'll well, screw up the name, but it's an M storm. It's Typhoon 26 Whiskey. Uh, that's uh, JT Joint Typhoon Warning Center has that forecast to come up to 150 knots. It's about 130 sustained right now. Uh, so it kind of makes Florence look like the junior varsity. Uh, and you get these big, big storms out there. And, and this is pretty typical for this time of year. There's also a tropical cyclone in the northern South China Sea. That's going to go through the uh, Gulf of Tonkin and into Hanoi, but probably only as a tropical storm there. So that's kind of the big picture. Uh, it is September. It's the heart of typhoon and hurricane season. Even so, it's a particularly active period uh, right now. So again, just looking at the Western Pacific very quickly. Yeah, Manka is the uh, is the storm. And again, if anybody is looking at these, just if you're an operational forecaster or for those who get into things that gets beyond the East Coast or even the United States. Uh, this is a publicly available website. You can type in Joint Typhoon Warning Center or JTWC Typhoon Forecast, and this, this is the first link that comes up. If the format looks similar uh, to what you see from the Hurricane Center, it's because it is. Uh, the Navy developed this, uh, what we call an Advanced Tropical Cyclone Forecasting System, ATCF. The Hurricane Center started using it about 15 or 20 years ago, and there's been a good uh, collaboration between Navy and the Hurricane Center on on improving the system throughout the, uh, the years and the decades. And you can see up at the top there, this uh, storm's forecast to get up to about 150 knots. Uh, went just to the north of Guam, they kind of, uh, they kind of dodged a bullet on this one. Uh, this track is okay, but this is the kind of track that Typhoon High End, if you remember Super Typhoon High End from a few years ago, did devastating storm surge. Take this track, move it about 200 kilometers south and you get another high end. So the Philippines looks like they're going to dodge this one, but you know you only got to move that day three, day four forecast a, a little bit to the south, and uh, and they've got an issue there. Here's the one going through uh, right, right over Maui, if you believe the uh, if you believe the forecast, and that's only a, a 24 hour forecast, so it's pretty good. Uh, Oliva has certainly seen better days. It does not look that impressive a storm. 55 knots, perhaps generous. Uh, coming down to 45 through the islands, but it's still going to produce a lot of rain. Anybody who's been out to Hawaii, a lot of terrain effects of both uh, water, but also wind. You can get funneling through some of those mountain passes. And this is just, again, not unprecedented, but a very unusual track. Uh, of course, the Hawaiian Islands had Hurricane Lane uh, about three weeks ago. So they're getting two within three weeks. And again, I, I think you'd have to go a long ways through the record books to find two named storms directly affecting the Hawaiian Islands within that kind of uh, time frame there. A uh, little fun fact, uh, the hurricane hunters uh, actually have an aircraft deployed out to Hawaii. So they are flying into the system while maintaining uh, almost constant coverage on, uh, on Florence on the, on the East Coast there. Okay, so this is what we have here. I think everybody knows that. As I said, if I was in the Gulf Coast, Texas, I'd watch that. Not so much for a hurricane wind surge event, but for rain. Uh, that, could, that could put a whole lot of rain in and around the Galveston, Houston area by the, uh, by the end of the week. We'll start with the easy ones first. Uh, I've been in Joint Typhoon Warning Center when we had to do five. Uh, active main storms at one time and all you're doing is you figure out like which one or two are the most important and you put your most junior guy on storms three four and five and hope the guy that doesn't come back to bite you uh, I know the guy who's doing this he's the most junior guy uh, at the at the hurricane center and this is thank God uh, Helene is a, a well-behaved uh, system it's gonna come way out I mean unless you're in the Azores but it's a well-behaved system the model guidance is, is very tight in both intensity as well as on track, and nobody in the U.S. is going to care about this one. So this warning, I'm not saying this is how they do it, but they can probably knock this out in about five or ten minutes and then worry about the other ones. Quick question on this. As you go further out, mm -hmm. the guidance diverges, and you go somewhere between northern Norway and Portugal for landfall. So it's like right beyond that point, the models just yeah, they, they they do this. Uh, there's probably a lot of extra tropical transition mixed up into that. 
uh, and they're going to say, you know, that's going to be the Europeans' problem. Uh, so between UK Met Office, ECMWF, I mean, they'll they'll uh, and the Video France and stuff, they'll they'll pick that up. But for the Hurricane Center, this is like, yes, it's a name storm. Yes, it's a hurricane. Thank you very much. Let's let's move on. Is is I mean, they're not going to put that in a discussion. But that's how it's going to be. <laughs> Having done these before. Okay, uh, the next one, somewhat more interesting, as Professor Young mentioned, you know, not all guidance is clustered. And, and on Isaac, there's actually a fair amount of divergence starting at about day three. And there is a number of UK met, I think the Navy model as well. And I thought I saw at least one run of the European taking this a little bit further northward, and a couple models quite a bit further northward. So right now we've got just a sort of classic straight runner track uh, going south of Jamaica. But if I was, again, Puerto Rico, I'd be paying attention to this one. Certainly Dominican Republic, even Haiti. Uh, going to have to keep an eye on this. So if, again, if you're at the Hurricane Center sort of managing this, you don't want to let you don't want to let your guard down, especially given what happened to Puerto Rico a year ago. Uh, there would be a lot of sensitivities to that. So you need to pay some attention to this one. Interesting that although they have the uh, warning speed down to, I think it's about 55 or 60 knots, uh, by the time it's approaching the islands, they have a hurricane watch and not a tropical storm watch out for it. Okay, I heard there's some other stuff going on. So let's see if I can make this work. This is always the hardest part of doing these briefs, is figuring out the IT part and not shutting down the, uh, not shutting down the Google Hangouts at the same time. There we go. Uh, no. I had, had a whole set of uh, links open so that you guys don't have to watch me go complaints. Inter okay, I know, so I, now we use, we use all kinds of other stuff. There we go, okay, I think we can make this work here. Yes, we have technology. Okay, so on the e-wall, if I can make this animate. Okay, I'm just gonna run because I really don't care about 16 days on this. Uh, so I kind of like to start, and you know, for anybody doing forecasting, it's, I don't think this is a terrible way to do this, is you kind of start with the big picture, and then you sort of work yourself down into the you know, synoptic, and then ultimately mesoscale, and things that are going to impact. So kind of for the big picture, before we get into the tracks and the details of Florence, you, know, you sort of want to know what's going on. And so this is uh, from the uh, GFS. This is actually GFS Ensemble. And it's, of course, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so we'll see kind of how the spaghetti plot uh, goes. But one of the things I like about this set of graphics is not only does it show you the, uh, the long wave pattern, uh, but it also shows you the anomalies. And one of the things that's been interesting about Florence, if you, if you take a look at this track, it's, although not unprecedented, it is very unusual. Uh, usually when you have storms well to the sort of southwest of, or excuse me, southeast of Bermuda, they just go, as everybody who's not in the Navy says, harmlessly out to sea. Uh, and, and, they, and getting a storm here to come in into the coast is pretty unusual. But if you remember six years ago, yeah, six years ago, Sandy, one of the things that drove that in was an anomalous ridge to its north and northeast. And once again, what do we see with uh, Florence? But you know, I think I read, I don't know if it's true or not, but these are, if they're not record anomalies, they're near record anomalies. They're very strong anomalies, positive anomalies in the ridging. So as you can imagine, if you have that kind of ridging, what are you gonna do? Anything under that ridge is gonna get driven much more to the to the west by that by that circulation. And in fact, that's that's what we've seen happen. So really the question you, you want to ask yourself is does that stay long enough to, uh, to actually drive, uh, drive Florence into the coast? Or is there anything else that's going to come and either pick it up and, and take a much more classic track of, of parallel to the coast rather than, than uh, a straight shot in, which we know are the, are the most dangerous. Thing. So here's this, I should have mentioned, I'm sorry, this is a 6C run. This is 6C run from, uh, from very early this morning. So here's uh, 24 hours from now, so that will be tomorrow morning, uh, 36, 48. And really what you can see is at least in the GFS representation, 
Uh, this bridge stays, and it pretty much stays through, let's see, uh, through landfall. Although you can see in the GFS, uh, the, the storm basically hangs out along the North Carolina coast over Hatteras for, uh, for a little while. We'll see if that, if that happens. But this, this anomalous ridge is a pretty persistent feature through five days. You know, here's day six, day seven, and it starts finally breaking down there. So that's kind of the main part. There's uh, when you look at for, for us, there's nothing really anticyclonic in here. There's still a fair amount of moisture. So the fact that it's not raining, this may be about as good as it gets for the next few days for us. And we wouldn't be surprised to see some more showers. When you look at the uh, the, the ensembles, even out to about day six, day seven, it doesn't mean they're right, but that's not that's not a terrible amount of spread for the GFS. So the GFS, for better or for worse, is kind of uh, happy with this solution. Okay, let's see if I can get back to my slides. Not screw this up. All right, there is one one storm I was going to show you there. This uh, gray circle. I think Dr. Nees might have shown something kind of similar to this uh, last week. There, kind of when you look at where. Uh, where Florence is being. This is where Florence is pretty much right now, this morning. And this was sort of one of the more unusual tracks. So yes, I did find a storm there, although it was going in completely the opposite direction. It was going out towards sea, got to the Azores, realized it didn't have its visa, maybe they built a wall, <laughs> uh, and came back. And they came back south of Bermuda and then kind of took this track uh, that you see here, and in fact, uh, Ginger made landfall very, very close to where the Hurricane Center is forecasting landfall for Florence, although it was uh, <clears throat> marginal to somewhere between a two and a one when uh, when Ginger made landfall. That was uh, 1971, 118 advisories. You get truly sick of writing 118 of anything. Uh, second longest uh, storm, I believe, in the Atlantic. So that's uh, this is one of the challenges with analogs with relatively small sample sizes and large variants. Uh, and I know a lot of people, not a lot, but some people really, really, really like analogs. I'm not saying don't look at them, but be careful because it's really easy to draw the wrong lessons from a small sample size. Did Ginger also have an anomalous ridge? Right in the I'm not way? sure. I don't know. Yes. Okay. There's the answer. The answer is yes. If Paul says it, it's true. Okay, uh, ocean heat content. How are we doing? So we've got our storm there south southeast of Bermuda. Uh, 75 to 100 kilojoules per square centimeter. Not quite as much as what Katrina had when it went over the warm eddy. Katrina was up over between 100 and 125 when it went over that warm eddy. Uh, but this is certainly enough to support a, a major hurricane, probably somewhere between a Cat 4, Cat 5 with perfect conditions. So if you kind of look at this, you say, yeah, there's there's enough heat to uh, to do to do real damage here. And in fact, if uh, this is from, let's see if I've got the, I'm sorry, I, I cut off uh, who this came from. I know the, the uh, formulas here, this is carry a manual. If you basically take carry a manual's maximum potential intensity, convert it either into central pressure or into winds, uh, 29 to 30 degrees Celsius with sufficiently deep uh, water can, in fact, get you into these cap 4, cap 5 as a maximum potential intensity. Okay, so this is probably everybody's seen this. Uh, what the Hurricane Center has uh, put out, and it's quite similar to their 5 a.m. warning. This is the 11 a.m. Tuesday, uh, Tuesday warning, warning number 49. Uh, for the students, do you see anything kind of unusual with this warning as far as sort of the mixture of watches and trap? I don't even grade this. Okay, the thing that struck me, and you see this even more on the 5 a.m. warning, is you had a lot of hurricane watch to the south of where this comes in. So... Here's, a, here's another question. If you are, let's say this forecast verifies and we make landfall, Florence makes landfall north of Wilmington, which is the dirty side or which is the dangerous side of this storm? Like Hatteras, Virginia Beach, right? So if you're in Myrtle Beach, you say, ah, dodged a bullet. 
yet we have hurricane watches all the way down to Hilton Head or Charleston. Why do you think that is? It's probably, and I'll show you in a few times, I think the uh, Hurricane Center is concerned about what the Euro is showing. Because the Euro's tracks are, I guess I should have put this in a different order, but we'll just go uh, Yeah. Okay, I'll give away the C. There's the zero Z Euro. And I know the graphics aren't the best here, but uh, Charleston, is right here. Myrtle Beach is like right here. Wilmington, probably the biggest population center around here, is, is not looking good. I think the Hurricane Center, although just about all the other guidance, is up into North Carolina, the GFS ensembles, the Canadian, UK Met, all the Navy, I think, moved a little left on this last run. Uh, I think you've got to be, if you're the director of the Hurricane Center and you're looking at this and the Euro's being fairly consistent. My guess is that's what's driving uh, that hurricane watch to be as far down the Carolina coast. So if they move it, they can say, look, we've already put you in a watch. You should have paid attention. I think that's what's going on. Any other thoughts? Okay. I think I think that's what's going on. OK. Uh, who uses these wind probabilities? <coughs> If you're doing tropical cyclone forecasting, you should raise your hand. These are actually pretty good. And we started putting them in. We put them into the Navy and the <coughs> Hurricane Center at about the same time. This is now almost 10, 10 years ago, 8, 9, 10 years ago. Uh, one of the things when you're communicating this to users uh, is that relatively low probabilities still mean you better do something. Because think of it, you know, what's this is the 50 knot, and this is the one I use because this is really destructive winds. You know, 34, 40 knots are interesting, although with all the rain we've had now, they'll probably start taking down trees. But once you start getting to 50 knots or almost 60 miles an hour sustained, now you start really doing damage. So I take a look at the, at the 50 knot radius, and my rule of thumb for like telling ships you need to sortie or you need to move, it's basically 10%. You're in the 10% line, or and that stays constant or starts increasing over over a few warnings. It's it's time to get out of dodge. And you know some people say, well, geez, 10%. That means there's a 90% chance. You know this is all for nothing. But think about what the damage is if you're there, and also think about how high 10% is compared to a regular day. You know what's what's your odds on just any regular day of getting sustained 50 knot winds? really small, right? It's probably about 1 in 500 or 1 in 300, depending on where you are. And now this is 1 in 10. So if we talked about this like medical doctors, you would say there's a 200 or 300 or 500 times greater chance even at that 10% line uh, that you're going to have destructive winds in a normal day. And everyone says, oh my God, what should I do? So it gets into the communication. Uh, it gets into telling people that even what looks like a low probability, that 10% line, is actually pretty dangerous. And it's pretty anomalous. And you should probably, if you have valuable either people, things, things that you can move, preparations you need to make, you better be doing that. So you look at this, and 10%, this is this morning's uh, 50 knots, comes up, you know, up into the lower Chesapeake Bay, all the way down to Charleston. Uh, through at least the eastern half of North Carolina and up into uh, extreme southeastern Virginia. So, so that's, a, that's a chunk of area that really needs to be paying attention right now for winds. And we'll talk about some of the other hazards here uh, coming on. Okay, I was going to show, I'm watching, how long, how long does this go to? Uh, like 120. Or okay, we've, yeah, we've got some. If I can make these things work. That's always the thing. Uh, Okay, I'll just talk about, there's not much sound on this, and this is quick. Uh, so this is basically, you might have heard the uh, Norfolk uh, is sorting the, the fleet, the Navy is sorting the fleet as of yesterday. And you say, well, geez, yesterday, this storm isn't really going to get there till Friday. Why so long? Uh, and there's a couple of reasons. One, it takes a while to get out of Norfolk. You can only move roughly about four ships an hour. 
out of Norfolk. Uh, it comes down to tug services and a lot of other logistic things that you don't just like everybody leave in five minutes. It's not like emptying Beaver Stadium. Uh, so you you have to uh, yeah you have to do that. And then what I'll do if I can make the analogy work is oops wrong one sorry show. Why do you need to get so far out so quickly? And it's not just getting out of Norfolk. So Norfolk is basically right about here. Uh, these are the sea, sea heights, wave heights in meters. Okay, so anything over about four meters, especially five meters, 12 to 15 feet roughly, you don't go very far, even on a Navy ship, very fast. Uh, you're not going to go zorching around at 25 or 30 knots because you're going to just beat the crap out of the ship and then you don't go very far. So whenever you have a storm coming up from your south, you've got to leave not only to get out of port, it's about a three hour uh, transit down the, down the channel, but now you have to get basically across the storm so that you're not caught in these you know, 15, 20, 30 foot seats, which becomes very, very dangerous. So you got to add all of that timeline up. So you are making these decisions five days out. This is why the Navy pushed the Hurricane Center really hard about 15, 10 to 15 years ago to extend their forecast out to five days. They did not want to do this for a whole variety of reasons. They're still not excited. But a three-day forecast to sort these ships was absolutely useless to us. So we needed, and we wanted, and, and the models started giving us skill at day four and day five. And that's about the minimum amount of, of warning that we need to get these, these ships out. So it's not only just getting out of port, but then it's getting someplace safe and avoiding these kind of seas. That's what we have. Okay. Let's go back here. And you've probably seen these. I'm going to go in the interest of time a little bit more quickly here. Uh, these come out of courtesy of uh, NCAR, their, uh, their RAL division there. Uh, there's a lot of places you can find them on the web. So again, the, the guidance is pretty well clustered except for the European. Uh, NVGM, that's the Navy model nav gem. It sort of looks like you know that kid in the Simpsons with the dunce hat on. I'm not quite sure what it's doing there. Uh, there's a lot of weird stuff going on by Hatteras, and that's kind of showing the system slows down or even stalls. So we'll probably see a pretty big deceleration, and you see that reflected in the official warning as well. Uh, again, the, the GFS ensembles, a lot of stuff. The reason it's so dense and hard to read is because basically it's stalled and it's writing the timestamps all over itself on there. And then let's see. This is just another version of the of the ensemble guidance from the from the uh, GFS. And they're playing around with different ways of trying to trying to look at it. So if you believe the GFS, it's like, hey, this is a North Carolina and Virginia storm. It's not South Carolina, and and that's great unless you're the Europeans. They're still locked on. We'll see what the 12Z run when it comes out early this afternoon. It'll be very interesting to see if if the Euro starts marching up to the coast. Or, uh, or vice versa, or if they're just going to continue this uh, this time. Okay, we've talked about yeah, we talked about the warnings covering basically where the euro says this thing on the the watches I should say. The rains, of course. So we talked about the winds. Winds are fun to talk about. Uh, the rain is not fun, but somebody's going to get two to three feet of rain, this thing, especially if it stalls. So you get sort of a Harvey kind of uh, kind of influence there. Is that going to be on Hatteras? Is it going to be Southern Virginia, Central, uh, East Central, North Carolina? Somebody's going to get a ton of it. Storm surge, uh, not the Katrina kind of 30 foot, 25 to 30 foot, but still 10 to 15 feet does a big damage. And again, for especially for the students, if you're ever forecasting storm surge, where you see the worst storm surge is not necessarily on the coast. It's off these estuaries and bayous. You funnel the water, and it funnels and funnels and funnels and has nowhere to go, and it goes up. And that's why you see these reds really pretty far inland, not on the coast. And people who live along these things think, oh, I'm not on the coast. I'm in good shape. 
and then they find out that they got like seven feet of water coming into their house, and it's, and it's not good. Uh, we saw this in Katrina a lot, and they're going to see this on the on the trail. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop. How much time do I got? Oh, okay. Well, good. So I've got a little bit of time to just talk about a couple other things. If I can again make money my machines run. So any here, let me stop here before I get into some, some local stuff. So really the, the question is, I mean, the, the big synoptic situation for Florence is pretty easy. Anomalously strong ridge, going to drive it in, hit a short wave, weaken the ridge, it either stalls on the coast or keeps moving. You know, and, and it's not a huge difference between the Euro and the GDFS. It's do you come in north of Wilmington, North Carolina, or on or south or just south of Wilmington, but if you're in Wilmington, it makes a huge difference, just like we saw with, I think it was Isaac last year with Miami, which, which side of Miami or Tampa Bay you come. So the overall error statistics are going to look good. Uh, but again, if you're in those centers, there's a huge difference between coming in just 20, 30 miles north or 30 miles south. And that's going to be, I think, probably what the hurricane center is going to, going to try to work on. Okay, this is just something I'm sure a, a number of you, sorry, uh, watch. I, I like, uh, for short range product, I found this to be pretty useful. This is the uh, Her Ensemble forecast. Uh, it's on the SBC website. Uh, and not only is it there, but the graphics are nice too. You did, the concept. So this is, I think we've got the 12, uh, I think when the link came over, it's an old link. Uh, here we go. The uh, the Her Ensembles actually did a pretty nice job in the short run with the rain here, and they included the rain last night. They we got that as, as well. Let's see if we can close this. There we go. Okay, we do have just about all the twelves. So you can you can either loop this or you can just run this through. But you can see that for State College. At least for today, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, tomorrow, though, again, nothing really organized, but uh, there's nothing to really suppress high degrees of moisture. There's no real subsidence or no sinking motion. Remember, we've got that ridge that's building up, so we're kind of on the dirty side of that uh, of that ridge. So you either take just a small port max, uh, small degrees of instability, you know, and you can get some shallow. So it's still and it, that. That pattern continues. You can start seeing Florence coming on at the very, uh, very end of the curve. It'll be interesting to see what, what we'll do with that. Okay. Uh, let's see. My next one is I've showed the ensembles. There we go. So, again, just kind of looking out a little bit further um, on the four panel, pretty much what we've talked about. And again, this is going to have the uh, you know, the GFS solution. So again, just sort of for forecasting, and you really got to pay attention to this sort of October, September, October, especially, you get these big storms, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, the typhoons in the Pacific. And when they do that mid-latitude transition, the models tend oftentimes to have big, big trouble with that. So you'll start seeing at these out times some pretty big changes in the model because you're putting a lot of, of uh, heat fluxes and moisture fluxes, uh, uh, basically energy into the jet stream where previously the model was not expecting that. So you significantly change the you know, kind of initial conditions. So you get some very different answers. So just you know when you're going out, say, five, 10, two weeks or so for some sort of outlooks if you're in the energy business or agriculture business. you got to be careful of that. I didn't see that that big, big typhoon in the Pacific. Looks like it's not going to do the big extra tropical transition. But you got to watch out for these things. They can really screw up the uh, screw up the models here. But again, out to about five, six days, you know, the, the question, of course, is going to be where we come up or does it take more than Europe? Uh, and, and stay down in the uh, down in the southeast part of the country. Okay, and let's see. I think, yeah. If you want to see something kind of fun, 
I don't know when the last time was I saw a QPF of 30 inches. This is not snow. This is rain. But 30 inches by house on the 6C. Now, that's, that's actually the deterministic run. The ensembles are somewhere in only the 15 or so. Uh, but that's a, that's a lot of water. I have no idea if that'll verify, but somebody's probably going to get something like that. And I don't think I've ever seen on these uh, plumes a 30-inch. Uh, and again, you know, it's, that's impressive if it was snow at 10 to 1. We'd all be, we'd all be very excited. Okay. Uh, do I have my last graphic? Last graphic. Okay, I'm going to end with something I like to watch. I may be the only person in the U.S. who looks at this. Uh, but I like to look at the NAICS. I found the NAICS as being a fairly good guidance for what's coming up in that 8 to 14. Uh, the bad news is it doesn't have the continuity of humans. The good news is it doesn't worry about the continuity of humans. It just kind of tells you what the models have. And we had been, and it was accurate, uh, significantly above normal for the first part of September. It's kind of showing near normal. Really, these are low probabilities, either above or below. So kind of near normal. And maybe what we should like even more is it's not showing any huge wet period for us in the middle, uh, sort of the third week of the, uh, of the month. Good news for the uh, British Columbia. Uh, they've had some really bad fires out there, Vancouver Island and, and British Columbia. It looks like the rainy season's starting, although maybe a little bit in the Cascades and Olympic Mountains, uh, but California still has a long ways to go to. Okay, I think with that, uh, happy to take any questions if we have time for questions. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're done. Any questions? questions? Any questions? Odds of Somebody's got to have some odds questions. of a wet football game. Then. Odds of a wet football game. Yeah. Well, you know, that you're gonna <laughs> that you're gonna get some kind of rain in that period, probably thirty percent or so, thirty to forty percent. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, you know, is it gonna be an all day washout like it was this past weekend? Are you you know? But if but if you're going to put all your paycheck on, it will not rain at all. Eh, you're a braver person than I am. <laughs> we don't. Is it dangerous for the Navy to have so many ships at sea, so concentrated, so predictable for foreign submarines to pick up, for example? Uh, not really. I mean, we're not at war with anybody right now. Oh. And the, well, at least we're not in a beyond phase zero, phase one kind of conflict. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, if it's in really rough conditions, it screws up the bad guys as well as the good guys. So, but we, we have some understanding in general of where potential bad guys are, and you can still avoid them. It's a big ocean. Uh, or you can screw around with them. You can do a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> turns out, not to get too far afield here, but these typhoons and hurricanes give a lot of opportunities to, uh, to significantly change the acoustics under sea. And if you know how to use that, you can really gain some advantage. I'll just I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. With where it seems like storms are stalled out, mm -hmm. would you get any of that storm surge into the Chesapeake from the following at all? Or? I think the Chesapeake may not have more than two or three feet. Uh, it doesn't look like too much of an Isabel track. So for those who remember, Isabel came just west of the Chesapeake. This is the one that did a, a ton of damage into Annapolis, into the Naval Academy, and, and, and a lot of places lower down. As long as the track, I'll go back to the ensemble, uh, is more like that, or take one of these tracks. If it goes far enough west, it's probably going to fall apart as far as wind winds driving the surge fairly quickly. You do still have with this anomalous flow, I mean, I've got some friends living on the Chesapeake that like this weekend were saying I'm trapped in my house. Just with this anomalous easterly, persistent easterly and northeasterly flow, the tides have been running two or three feet above normal already in there. The rains, of course, screw this up because the rains are trying to you know, go somewhere if you keep this up. So I, I think, you know, you wouldn't want to say nothing. But it's probably in the two to three feet range as opposed to catastrophic, you know, this is Isabel writ large. Uh, 
but the, the track going going forward will will be terminated. Anyone else? Going, going, going. All right, thanks, Dr. All right, thanks. And then next week, we'll have Dan DePazin from McElroy. Close everything here? I guess we're not. Oh, yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome.